Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. And Ephesians is such a rich book. You know, whenever I turn there, I, I'm just think, oh, well, we need to read this verse too, and we need to read that. But I'll just try and stick to it. Um, but he starts out in 14, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. Now here it is, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend how big this deal is. That's my paraphrase. You may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, by the way, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, how many want to be filled with all the fullness of God? We want the power, don't we? We, we want to be able to do exploits for the King of Kings, and we want to be fruitful, and we want all that. But now here he's giving us the fundamental key here, and that is that you and I should be rooted and grounded in love. See, once again, the main thing is that the main thing remains the main thing. Now, we've got to get this love part right, everybody. And that's what we're waiting on. I asked the Lord, what are we waiting on? Let's just get on with the harvest. And he told me, this is what we're waiting on. We're waiting on the body of Christ, first of all, to say, I want a revelation of the Father's love. I want to be drawn into this. I want a place in my heavenly daddy's heart to know that I'm secure in that so that whatever my little part to play in ministry and in the body of Christ, I'm totally fine with that. If I'm the ear, fine. If I'm the eye, fine. If I'm the foot, good. If I'm the head, all right. If I'm the hand, whatever. Maybe you're just a little finger. Is that okay? You're part of the body, see? Everybody needed. And so that's where we want to be, rooted and grounded in this agape love. Now, what does that love look like? John 14, 6, Jesus said, well, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And that's amazing. Uh, he pointed out to Thomas where we were going. And then in, in John 14, 8, Philip interrupts him now. And, and, and I think Philip's a little exasperated when he says it. It's like, show us the Father already then, and, and that'll suffice. And Jesus' answer is like, what? Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still don't recognize me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So how can you possibly say, show us the Father? What's going on here? Jesus is saying, the works that I do, they're, they're not my works. They're the works of him who sent me. I only do what I see the Father doing. I only say what I hear the Father saying. And so we've got this take on things as we read the New Testament that here's the operative theology that I was living under. Jesus is okay, but watch out for God the Father. Okay? Because he's like the big Pharisee in the sky. He's the big cop in the sky. But now here we're saying, no, no. These are one. The Father is one with the Son. They love each other. And he's saying, haven't you figured it out, Philip? If you've seen what I do, you, you've seen the Father's heart because he's the one that's behind it. Were you, were, you were there when we, when we healed that crippled woman. Remember her? 18 years bent over crippled and she turns up in in the meeting in the synagogue and and there were options there jesus could have said you know what if we heal her on the sabbath the leaders are going to be upset so 
how can we make this a win-win? I know. Why don't I ask her to come back tomorrow? What's she going to say? Sure. If that works for you, I'll be back tomorrow. I've been like this for 18 years. See you in the morning. But see, when Jesus is checking with the Father, he's saying, don't you make her wait one more second. I want her healed, and I want her healed now. Why? Because that's his heart. And so you just bite the bullet on the, on the, on the accusation and the misunderstanding that comes your way, and you just go ahead and heal the woman. And he did that with everything. I love the story of the leper in Mark chapter 1, where a leper comes to Jesus and he says, if you're willing, you can make me well. And he said, I'm willing, you know, be well, be healed. But then he did something that none of us in this room would do, and that is he touched him. Would you touch a leper? Would you? See, Jesus believed that uh, the unclean doesn't make the clean unclean. That was the old covenant. In the new covenant, the clean, the anointed, makes the unclean clean. And so he touched him, and I don't think it was like a, a carol touch, you know. I think it was a a whole, like a big hug. They probably fell down on the ground, rolling around laughing, just like that one verse in Matthew. But you ask the question, well, why, why did he do that? Why did he touch him? Was he just trying to make a statement to the apostles? Don't, don't fear leprosy, guys. We're, we, we have power over that. Maybe, but I think there was more to it. I think that, see, this guy had never had a hug in, in maybe 20 years. Even his own mother wouldn't touch him. He had to go around with a, you know, a little sign, a special robe, whatever, saying, unclean, unclean, stay away, don't come near, I'm, I'm contagious, stay back, stay back. Can you imagine the rejection that's all over this guy? Now here's a famous national rabbi, teacher, wowing the crowds with signs and wonders, who not only heals him, but also hugs him. What did that do for his heart? See, that's the message of the Father's love. That's why Jesus is somewhat puzzled at Philip's question. Have I been with you all this time, and you haven't figured it out, Philip? If you've seen me, if you've seen what I've been doing, now you know what the Father's like. Raise your hand to him and say, I love you, Abba. You're amazing. John 1.18 says Jesus has come to reveal him, to make him known. Now, Jesus came to do a number of things. He, he came to destroy the works of the devil. Hallelujah. He came to seek and to save those that are lost. Wonderful. But he also came, according to that scripture in John, John 1, 18, to reveal the Father, to make the Father known, to show you and I what kind of a God it is that we're dealing with. See, why would anyone bother to serve a God who didn't care anything about them, who didn't really love you? So we have a part of that revelation. We can quote John 3, 16. But I'm telling you, this goes a whole lot deeper than that. He wants to bring you into his heart and be a safe place for you to come. And not only that, so empower you to go out on your mission because now you have the capability of loving others and also loving yourself. And by the way, if you don't love yourself, you're probably not going to love others either. And so the question needs to be asked, why don't you love yourself? Answer, well, I believed a lie, that I'm fat, ugly, and stupid, and I'll, I'll, I'll never get it right. Turn to the person next to you and say, it's not true. And why it's not true is it doesn't 
it, it doesn't depend on your own self-effort. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's the Father in you that is empowering you and changing you and strengthening you. It's the Holy Spirit in you that's making all the difference. And so this is, this is, this is where we're going with this. And we need to know, well, what does love look like? Read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That's, that should be required reading every week, just to, just to keep a mirror in front of you. And then when you read it, then you ask the question, how am I doing, Holy Spirit? But he goes, love suffers long and is kind. And he concludes, love never fails. Luke chapter 6, 27 and following. Not just love yourself, not just love one another, not just love your tribe and love brothers and sisters, but even love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. Whew. Whole story of the prodigal son uh, from Luke 15. It's just such an amazing story, isn't it? Where the boy had done everything wrong. Aren't you glad that it was the father that met him rather than the older brother? How do I get there? First of all, desire it. That's point number one. Second, encounter his love by the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of love comes as a byproduct and as a result of the Holy Spirit touching you and filling you. And see, the, the character of the Holy Spirit is is what we want. What, what's he look like? Love. He looks like joy. He looks like peace. He looks like patience. He looks like gentleness and meekness and, 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 and temperance in our, in our behavior and finally self-control. One guy said to me, I'm glad you mentioned that self-control part because I've been to your meetings and it looks like a whole lot of people are out of control. <laughs> and I said, well, the gift is self-control. That's for you to control yourself, not for you to control the Holy Spirit. Yeah. See, because you couldn't use that one on Paul on the Damascus Road. Get up off the ground, man. What are you doing down there, you know? Well, it was the power of God that came upon him and knocked him to the ground, yeah? He was out of control, would you agree? He didn't sign up to be blinded. That happened against his will. But it was God who did that to him. So yeah, but he was an unbeliever. So what? Doesn't change anything. God did that. And so we have to make room for a God who's big enough, and he is, of course, to come and do whatever he wants to do. I forget where that is in the Psalms. But Bill Johnson was telling me about that verse. And uh, basically it says, I'm the Lord. I do what I want to do. Is that okay with you? Because he's always good. He's really, really amazing. And so we need um, to understand where we're going. We're going to the Father. We need to understand that the Father's kind and good. And then we need to know that you don't just pick this off the shelf. This is coming as Jesus selectively chooses uh, those who he wants to impart this to. And so he's looking for ingredients of the heart. He's looking for humility. He's looking for, for graciousness. He's looking for teachable spirit. He's looking for a number of things like that. And then it's his good pleasure for you to have an encounter that will absolutely change your story. Now we have a young lady in this room that came to our church in Toronto many, many years ago, I don't know, 25 years ago or so. And she was tricked into coming by a friend, and, uh, but got there. And I'm at the front teaching something about the Father's love. Little did we know she was 
suicidal. Her, her father had recently taken his own life and she just didn't see any, any reason to live. And I think she's about 17 or so at the time. And all of a sudden in the middle of my uh, teaching, which we used to be really quiet and you know, all of that in those days, there's this eruption of wailing and wailing and wailing going on at the back. So I said, just, just bring her up here. And we just, we just hugged her at that point. And she encountered love in church for the very first time. Now then, we all should be appalled at that. Because see, church should be the place where you go to encounter the Father's love. Don't you agree? I told you my testimony about my encounter. But there's people that become dramatic examples of this that you run into along the way. We were in India a few years ago ministering in our, one of our leader schools to about almost a thousand young pastors and leaders. And there was a guy in the class, and as we're going through, you know, the Father's heart and the importance of forgiveness and all this kind of stuff, he's there just like a statue. He's just hard like a stone, and it's not penetrating him. It's not getting into his spirit. And I'm like, oh, God, like, what is this guy's story? And so I ask the interpreter, and he starts telling me, oh, well, this young man, as most of them, they've all come from a Hindu background. And uh, when his father found out that he'd converted to Christianity, he came to him and said, I will give you 24 hours to renounce Christianity and return to the Hindu faith, or... I will kill myself. So he called him back the very next day, 24 hours later, and said, well, what have you decided? He said, Daddy, I can't give up on Jesus. I, mean, I found life. I found hope. I found joy. I found peace. I mean, he's changing me. I, I love you more, I, this or that or the other. The father shot himself right there and then in front of that boy. Now the family blamed him, and there's huge social implications in that country. Now we have no father because of you, and da 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 da. But he's 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 abs he's resolute. He's he's determined. He is not giving up on Jesus. Okay, good for him for that. But see, it so hardened him that now he cannot receive nor give love. Really, all he has to to share is the truth of God's Word devoid of love. And as we prayed with this young man and, and we got him to do two things, uh, to forgive his father for what he had done, and secondly, any, in any way that he blamed himself, like if only I hadn't had done this or if I had gone away or if I had this or the other, you know, woulda, shoulda, coulda, and he forgave himself, and he just broke and wept and, and tears and everything and just wept his way through to an emotional connection with the God of love that day. It was unforgettable. And see, see that's what's holding up the body of Christ. There's, there's things that have happened to us over the years. And uh, I told the story the other day of that young woman at that same school in India, it was just going over her head. She, she just couldn't get her head around, how can there be a father who is loving? So I asked, what's, what's, what happened to her? When she was three years old, she was sold by her father to marry a wealthy pedophile. And there she is, three years old, and then when she's 12, he's through with her. He throws her out on the street. Go. You no longer have a home here. Christians found her and brought her in. And now we fast forward. It's like uh, 10 or 15 years later. And there she is now in their, 
in, in their pastoring a, a little church and having a go, but she has no concept about what a loving father's like. And see, sometimes the, the, the fathers and mothers and authority figures we grow up with, it's not just fathers, but it's father figures or authority figures, fathers, mothers, pastors, teachers, uh, siblings, neighbors, etc., grandparents, etc. But how many of you in this room have never heard your earthly father say these words to you? I love you, my son. I love you, my daughter. Just unashamedly wave at me if that's you. I mean, hopefully we're in Christian circles here and you, you never, that most of us have heard that. How many of you never heard your mother say that? I love you, my son, my daughter. Wave at me. See, my wife Carol never heard her mother say those words until her mother was 90 years old. At 90 years old, she got healed up enough to really appreciate the, the, the gem of a daughter that she had raised. It's amazing to me. But what that does is it leaves a great big hole in our heart. And so now we're out like orphans, spiritual orphans, and we're striving and searching for recognition and looking for love in all the wrong places, and we're almost set up to fall into the enemy's trap. And there's many father types. I'll just introduce a thought to you here, but there's the absent father, the guy who was never there. He, he died when you were young, or he divorced his family and you hard to ever see him or he's traveling all the time and he's never home. So he's not there in your day-to-day -day stuff as a child to affirm you, to say, come on, I believe in you, you can do it, and all the affirmation that you need. Maybe he's always angry, he's always putting you down. Oh, you're never any good, you're stupid, you'll never amount to anything. You know, I can't believe you're my son or what. It's horrible, horrible the sort of things that is said to people and children growing up. And it, it leaves big wounds and big scars. Uh, there's a ministry called Light Up Your World that goes into schools and, and works primarily with, uh, you know, junior high kids. Uh, and, and, and they get them to write down on a sticky note some of the horrible things that have been said to them by parents or by people that count, you know. One little girl said, my, my father called me a slut. Another kid said, my father said that he can't believe that I'm his son. Another, they, and they just go on with all these things that wound very deeply and distort now the image of what a loving, caring father's supposed to be like. See, a father's supposed to have somewhat of the character of Jesus. Strong like a lion, gentle like a lamb. And you know when to be which. Right? There's the perfectionist father. Maybe he was a military man. Maybe he was just one of those guys. You bring your report card home and he, he looks at it, straight A's, but one B. What's that B doing there? Well, I don't know, but look at all the other A's. Never mind that. Look at that B. No son of mine should get a B in mathematics, this kind of stuff. Then there's abusive fathers. Physical abuse. Emotional abuse. Sexual abuse. So many, so many women are trying to live down the fact that they were sexually abused by a father or a grandfather or a family member. The shame and the devaluation, all that brought to them. What's the remedy? They need to become secure enough in their Heavenly Father's love so that they can move away from that and forgive the one who did that to them because now they can afford to forgive them because you know, they're not calling for justice anymore. They want grace and mercy, which is better. Then there's a passive father who has no time for you, 
so you're not important to him. What's the way out? Recognize it, forgive, receive God's love. I'm telling you that when the love of God becomes your security and you know, like Jesus, that you have a place in your heavenly daddy's heart, it will change you forever. And so there's like four steps here. This is, this is a love that I need. I need that kind of love. Number two, this is what I'm seeking for. I need it. Now I'm actively seeking and asking for this. Number three, it is a love that is supernaturally revealed by Jesus in the anointing. So I don't want you to minimize a spiritual encounter here where the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you and waves of love and waves of glory or whatever happens. I mean, I so love Joseph retelling the story about how he just shook out of his boots, literally, as the power of God came on him. But it wasn't just power, it was love. And so, see, never separate the power from his love. It's never separated. They, they go together. Point number four, this is a love that finds you. It's a love that finds you. Our friend Ed Peorick has a message on the love that finds you. And it's just a killer message. This is the Father's love, everybody. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom.